Welcome to America's Heroes Group. Good afternoon and welcome to America's Heroes Group Roundtable with partner Veteran Healthcare Policy Institute. It's Saturday, January 15th, 2022. January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. I am host Cliff Kelly. Please join America's Heroes Group now on our global live streaming Facebook radio talk show. Like and share so others will become connected to information and resources. You can also listen to America's Heroes Group on iHeart Radio app. Just search America's Heroes Group and watch us on digital TV streaming on Roku, Amazon, Fire TV, and Apple TV through our partner, Zandra's TV Networks. Wow, wow, Cliff, we are everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> this is Colonel Dr. Damon Arnold, the co-host of uh, Cliff Kelly. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith. Our digital media producer is the incredible Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. And today's topics, we have uh, VHI, VHPI, uh, the vet uh, partners uh, of is the Veteran Healthcare Policy Institute. Just want to do a shout out to my mother-in-law, uh, Pearlene Haywood. It's her birthday today. Happy birthday, uh, Mom! And we That's are looking great. forward to a great day with you later. Absolutely. Okay. That's uh, you. <laughs> I'm glad you did that. Otherwise, right. you'd have to find somewhere else to go. Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have Suzanne Gordon, who's the VHPI senior policy analyst, and her. Work expands over decades, reporting on health care programs, workers, policy, and she has also authored and edited 21 books. I don't know where wow. she gets any sleep in. But Suzanne has written two <coughs> books, The Battle for Veterans Health Care and Wounds of War. She is joined by Jasper Craven, the VHPI Interim Executive Director, and what they're going to be talking about is overbilling of the Community Care VA program. Hi, uh, how are you doing, Suzanne and Jasper? Great, thank you. No, Jasper. Okay. Okay, excellent. Suzanne, tell us a little bit more about this. W what is this thing about overbilling of the community care? Sure. Well, um, there was a an VA Office of the Inspector General report um, that came out recently about the fact that um, the people, the 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 uh, physicians, hospitals, different providers in the private sector network that's been assembled by um, the under the Mission Act. It's the so-called Community Care Network um, <clears throat> has been um, overbilling the VA to the tune of millions, more than a, the conservative estimate was more than fifty-nine million dollars for what are called evaluation and management services, which include everything from sort of taking a history to making decisions about medical care to follow-up care, et cetera. Um, and that they found that something like, um, uh, I can't remember, it's like 48%, 47% of these providers, these private sector providers were overbilling the VA. They were, they were, um, they were submitting bills for services that they didn't provide, or or doing what's called upcoding, which is mm -hmm. saying that they're doing more than they're actually doing, so you can charge more for the service. And um, you know, this doesn't sound like a very sexy thing. You know, the code you put next to to uh, the billing code that you put next to. Um, to the service, but in as you know, Damon, in, in the private sector, I mean, these are called CPT codes, right? There's, and that's how you bill. You, everything has a code, you know, and the higher the 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 code determines how much you're paid. So if you code, if you upcode, if you say you're doing something more complicated than what you actually are doing, or even if you're doing nothing and you say you did it, you can charge more. And a, an astonishing, almost 47% of, of providers, it was something like um, 
oh my God, over 70,000 of, of 218,000 providers were doing this. And the, and the, um, there was an increase. The, the, the charges for between 2017 and 2020, the charges for these evaluation and management services increased by 350%. And they found that they they either didn't provide these services or that the VA was sort of being double billed for the services because there's a what's called a <clears throat> a, a surgical bundle and in the bundle of you're you're paid for you know doing the surgery and evaluating the patient and doing you know during before during and after the surgery doing evaluations and that's in the bundle so I'm going to make it up. You know, Damon, you you as a surgeon charge, I don't know, forty grand for X surgery for knee surgery, and included in that forty grand is evaluation and management services. But these providers were then building on top of that forty thousand more money for evaluation and management services that they were already providing. Ah, so like double billing. Mm -hmm. Double billing was it's it's called upcoding, and mm -hmm. what was really upsetting, and we did an article on this in this OIG report, was that the OIG, which said this is upcoding, sort of said that the remedy for this was um, that the VA needed to better educate these providers about how to use CPT codes. Mm -hmm. Well, these providers are already educated about how to. You see PT codes. These aren't. This isn't a bunch of new people who just got out of medical school, mm -hmm. or nursing school, or PT school, or whatever, and went into practice. These are hospital, you know, existing hospital system, existing practitioners. They know all about CPT codes, and they also know how to upcode because upcoding, as Alan Sager, who's a professor of policy and finance at BU School of Healthcare Policy and Finance at BU School. Of Public Health said, you know, this isn't some rookie era. This is this is something they regularly do in the American healthcare system to get more revenue, undeserved revenue. You know, they upcode, and the the VAOIG just kind of proposes a slap on the wrist, which is you know, you sit in front of a computer screen and learn about coding when Medicare defines it as a criminal offense. It's theft. It's fraud. It's a criminal practice. And, you know, I was stunned when I read the report that the OIG didn't approach it that way. You know, they approached it as always some kind of rookie era error. And the other thing they found, which was hardly surprising to us at VHPI, was that the, um, you know, the Mission Act created this network, this community care network, which is administered by two private insurance companies, one of which is called TriWest, which administered the um, the veteran the Veterans Choice Program, and TriWest was found TriWest and, and HealthNet, which was the other administer third party administrator of the Choice Program, they they upcoded themselves. They fraudulently billed the government of, you know, something like over $100 million, TriWest alone had to pay back the government $179 million. Um, wow. and, and yet Congress, knowing this record of fraud and abuse on the part of the TPAs, the TriWest, chooses TriWest, you know, to be uh, the, a third-party administrator of the Mission Act Community Care Network, and they also found that TriWest and Health and Optum, which is another TPA, were not, um, you know, tra properly training um, the providers on on how to bill. Well, big surprise. I mean, because they themselves upcode and fraudulently abuse the government. Yeah, because I, you know, I was going to ask you when you were mentioning before uh, that, that that they had actually. Um, $59 million in, um, you know, the upcoding uh, that was charged. Did they get that money back? Because this is, this is actually taxpayer money, right? Yeah, they're taking it out of your pocket and my pocket. Right. And, the, and, the vet, and they're taking it out of the veterans' pockets. And veterans are taxpayers, too. They're, you know, they, they're mm -hmm. 
paying for their own health care system through their own tax dollars. They're never going to get this back. I mean, the amount of, of money that the government get, got back from uh, Trilist, the $179 million is a fraction of what they actually, you know, paid out. I mean, that's always the case. So, you know, even if these companies pay fines, they, they never have to pay back the whole thing. They never go to jail. And, you know, there's really no incentive for them to stop these practices because there's no serious criminal penalties. I mean, Medicare, which does take this far more seriously than the VAOIG did, is notorious for not prosecuting enough and more robustly for, for all this kind of fraud and abuse. Yeah. So in that situation, you know, when you're in that situation, do you feel that the uh, are the veterans actually charged anything different, like co-pays or? No, no, the um, veterans aren't charged okay. mm -hmm. more, but the the system is charged more, and mm -hmm. you know, 179 million here, 59 million there, 40 million here. Right. That starts adding up, and there's no more money to hire staff. There's no more money to add new programs. You know, there's no more money to fill vacancies. I mean. It's a lot, you know, some of this is, it, I mean, TriWest yeah. and Optum and, and HealthNet receive billions of dollars for every, you know, appointment that they make. I think they charge something like $318 or something like that. Okay. And, you know, they're not doing their job and they're actually stealing. But, you know, the veteran is, the veteran's pocket is picked mm -hmm. because, well, the veteran's pocket is picked twice. The veteran's pocket is picked as a veteran who gets reduced quality services, and the veteran's pocket is picked as a taxpayer. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the fact is that if you increase, I mean, the budget for private sector care, according to this VAO, rep this VAOIG report, has increased between 2017 and two and 2020 by 500 percent. I mean, there's various figures. You know, some say it's 200 percent, some say it's 500 percent. The point is a lot of money is going out the door for care that is taking longer to deliver, you know, um, than the VA. And now we have Omicron and, and the total collapse of the American health care system. I mean... <laughs> You know, Damon. I mean, yeah. Chicago, San Francisco. I mean, these hospitals are are collapsing. Yeah, and you know, it's really interesting because I was wondering, what if they had just taken that money and invested in hiring more people in the VA? Yeah, system, really. Doing the things that needed to be done to keep the system going. Every other country in the world is modeling itself after our VA care system, the way it operates, the efficiencies. It's just amazing that we are not. Uh, yeah, but they're destroying the system. I mean, they are yeah. deliberately or through incompetence destroying the system. And and I think that veterans and Americans of all kinds, because of the VA's fourth mission, given the collapse of the American health care system because of COVID, depend on the VA more than ever before. Why are you sending a single veteran out who could be cared for in the VA into a hospital system where they have to have the National Guard trained for a couple of weeks in order to be nursing assistants? Right. No, that that's totally makes sense. And you know, and also the vet, you know, the veterans. Um, the, the, you know, I know the care workers who work in the VA, and they are really concerned. The nurses. Um, you know, the docs, people who are there, uh, the pharmacists, right, uh, the, the people who are doing technical things like, e, you know, EKGs and uh, radiology. And, I, you know, I look at that, and we have a system right now that has been ransacked by uh, the pandemic. So COVID-19 has long-term implications coming up for those who have already have underlying chronic diseases and for those people who are all otherwise healthy who actually contracted COVID-19. We have a diminishing uh, healthcare workforce that's out there. You know, right. we should be consolidating maybe in the, within the VA system to strengthen that rather than weaken it because we don't know what, yeah. the, what the possibilities are going to be in the future for actually seeking care. Right now, if you want to get a colonoscopy, it can take you nine months. <laughs> 
by that time you're going to stage four cancer. I mean, so we, we you know, we have, uh, we have a system where, uh, th you know, the opportunities to get care outside, uh, I don't think uh, they're as uh, efficient or as timely as the VA system is operating currently. No, I completely agree with you, and I think that, the, you know, every dollar spent on fraud and abuse is a dollar not spent on care on veterans in the VA, right? And every dollar spent on the private sector is is every veteran, particularly now, sent into the private sector is overwhelming a system that's already overwhelmed. I mean, you know, even if you thought outsourcing was a good idea, which I don't, this is not the time to be doing it. Yes. You know, and, you and know. Right, right now, Suzanne, you know, we're, we have about two minutes to go. And what I want you to do is tell people how should they get involved in this, how v veterans, their, their caretakers, their families. It's a family yeah. affair, right? With well, I think, mm -hmm. it, you know, I mean, you can hear in, in my voice the sense of outrage I'm feeling about what's going on. And I think people have to exercise citizenship, you know, and and be calling their political representatives and maybe rallying. I mean, in New York, nurses in VA rallied in front of a VA about the short staffing. I think people have to have rallies. I think they have to raise attention to the problem. In America, nothing changes, as we saw with the civil rights movement and the women, the you know, women getting the right to vote and the end of slavery and so forth. You know, people don't just change because they say, oh, gee, it's not nice to be, you know, why, gee, why haven't we given women the vote? You know, you have to really raise a stink. Mm -hmm. And I think veterans need to raise a constructive stink about this. Yeah. Um, and they have to get their family members to make calls and their mother and their mother-in-law and their father and, you know, like get get on email and really say enough is enough. Yeah. And so the, it's the old adage, uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? It's still going on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Frederick Douglass said it, you know, power <laughs> never cedes to, to just, you know, you have to, to raise the stakes. And so I think it's time to do that. And I'm not, you know, and I don't mean... No, um, but I, I just think that people need to, to exercise their citizenship while they've got it, which is, you know, <laughs> another whole question, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. And, and I think it's also, you know, a question about, you know, you were mentioning before the monitoring of how people are doing things and all of that. So it's a matter of making sure we have a good system. The VA system is a good system, and it can be right. know, amped up with all this extra money. So we are now out of time. And uh, I really want to thank you, Suzanne. You're one of our partners, outstanding. All thank you so you much, Damon. Uh, throughout the year. So happy New Year to you, and we look forward happy to Happy New Year to you. Take very good ADHPI. care. <laughs> all right, take okay. care. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, so we're moving on to the next segment. Stay with us, stay with us, be here or be square, even in this year. Thank you. <laughs> 